Hi, this is Chris Pavoni, and this is the story behind my stories. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret White. Terry Brooks. Sheena Kamal. Matthew Quick. J.T. Ellison. Walt D. Williams. Brad Ford. Corey. Dr. O. Brandon Sanders. Robin Mock. Ernest Klein. Jim Butcher. Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Chris Pavoni. It's episode 241 of the Author Stories Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Find all the archives of the show at hankgarner.com, and there are links there where you can subscribe to the show so that you never miss an episode. I'd like to thank some sponsors today for making this show possible. If you would like to sponsor the show, go to hankgarner.com, and there's a link in the top menu bar where you can click to find out how you can advertise on the show to bring more quality content. Tales from the Canyons of the Damned is my very favorite monthly publication. This is pulp goodness like you remember from when you were a kid in some of those great magazines. Tales from the Canyons of the Damned, the Halloween special is out right now. Go pick it up today. Bob Williams series, Blood and Chaos, which combines Music City Macabre and Arch City Apocalypse. Music City will never be the same. If you ever wondered what would happen at the end of the world, well now you can through the lens of Nashville, Tennessee. Music City Macabre and Arch City Apocalypse collected together as blood and chaos thirdscribe.com authors you need a website you've heard me say it time and time again and readers if you'd like to connect with your favorite authors go to thirdscribe.com rob and the folks there have built a community that links readers and writers in a brand new fresh way you're gonna love it go check out thirdscribe.com today the paragons trilogy by c stephen manley when dark portals open, heroes will awaken. Israel and Aaron are strangers with an uncommon bond. Not only did they just wake up in an unfamiliar warehouse with no memories of how they got there, but they're also the next potential victims for a pack of hideous mutants, at least until a covert organization saves their lives and takes them to meet an eccentric billionaire. It turns out that Israel and Aaron have something in common with the heroes of ancient mythology as well. They share unique genetic remnants that both trigger superhuman abilities and attract a group of equally mutated doomsday cultists. You're going to love this series. If you like urban fantasy, you're going to love Awakened. Book one of the Paragons trilogy. Go pick up the whole series now. Essence, book one Septima by Nick Breaker. You've heard me talk about Nick Breaker's science fiction with the Galactic Satori Chronicles. Check out this brand new series that he started. Essence, the first book in a new sci-fi series by Nick Breaker, a coming-of-age tale full of adventure and steamy encounters. Go check out this book. You're going to love it. Nick is one of my favorite writers, and you're going to love this new series he started. The Ember War Saga by Richard Fox. Dragon Award winner Richard Fox. If you're looking for military sci-fi, this is some of the best you'll ever find. The Ember War by Richard Fox. Nine books are available now. If you're looking for a new series to get into but don't want to wait on the author to catch up to you, go pick this up now. Richard Fox. Thanks to my friends at Keystroke Medium, one of the best writing shows on YouTube. They have a live show every Monday. Go visit them now. See the link in the show notes, Keystroke Medium. As always, at the end of the show, we're going to have an audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Thanks for listening. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Chris Pavoni on the show today. You probably have heard of his novel, The Expats, and his new novel is called The Travelers. Uh, welcome to the show, Chris. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming on. Um, I begin each show with the same question. And that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or a storyteller? Oh, what a terrific question. Uh, I'm pretty sure that would be third grade, Mrs. Erdrich. I wrote a book report that was also supposed to be uh, a sort of book, like it needed to have a cover and a, a description of it. And then it was illustrated and it was a biography of the California migrant workers, labor leader, Cesar Chavez. Wow. And I still remember the, the thing that I ended up drawing for the covers, the holding up a fist and unity with the other workers. And it was just, a, a, I think, a bizarre choice for a kid to make <laughs> as far as a teacher was concerned. Right. But my, my parents were 
very politically active and they were they were union organizers they were they were in the new york city public school system and uh and that that passion came through but mostly what i remember about it for me was the joy uh of having created a whole book and you know it was just paper folded upon paper it was not like it was, it was printed at a manufacturing plant it was just uh but it was the whole thing and i remember being so proud of it and i i remember getting a good grade on it or whatever she said this is this is great and i remember having it holding it in my hand as an object and thinking this is a terrific thing and it wasn't so much strangely enough about about the writing it was about the book itself and um eventually that that made me work in book publishing for really my entire adult life how cool uh what grade did you say that was i think it was third grade it was either third or second well, first, uh, hats off to that teacher uh, for being, you know, forward thinking and uh, and doing something cool like that to to really, you know, try to capture kids' imagination. Uh, what a neat project! Yeah, it was. Yeah, uh, it was great fun. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Um, were you an avid reader uh, before that, or did uh, yeah. maybe after that? What what sorts of things uh, were capturing your imagination at the time? I was an avid, avid reader, and I, I I remember consuming very widely anything that appealed to me, including a lot of tie-ins to popular culture that were not not in any way literature. Like I read uh, novelizations of movies and Star Trek books. I read um, science fiction. I read any book that had anything to do with baseball. Uh, I, I remember learning way too much about adult behavior from a, a <laughs> memoir called, I think, Whitey and Mickey, which is about <laughs> Whitey Ford and Mickey Mantle, and they were badly behaved. And I thought I was reading a, a baseball book, and as it turned out, I was reading a book about <laughs> drugs and alcohol and sex and um, all the salacious stuff that goes with it. I, I think one of the things that I'm grateful for in my growing up was that reading was not something that. I needed to do only because it was literature. We didn't just read in in my household because it was a great book. Uh, we read whatever we were interested in. And there was a lot of this stuff there that wasn't really, I mean, you take a novelization of, of Star Trek and this is, you know, this is the Star Trek, the original television show. And people were making books out of like riffs on that. And it was not literature in any way, shape or form, but it was, it was engrossing to me and all this other ancillary stuff, this non, non-literary non reading content out there in the world is something that I embraced pretty young and then moved away from, sadly, in, in high school and in college and taking literature classes when you're, you have these things foisted upon you from, from Shakespeare and uh, up through – contemporary Pulitzer Prize and Nobel Prize winning fiction and fiction becomes something with a capital F there and literature becomes something with a capital L and you spend a lot of your life or I spent a lot of my life as a, as a teenager and young adult reading this stuff that was sometimes beautiful and sometimes really rewarding and also sometimes brutally boring and bad very <laughs> often not saleable and not read by people who have a choice in the matter. They yeah. just, books that are that are in the canon for some way reason or another they got there and they never left and so high school teachers have been making teenagers read these books for generations now and and i'm not dismissing any of that but it's a different category of of entertainment or pastime or even introspection than reading more popular types of of narratives, whether they're they're fiction or nonfiction, there's a, obviously a lot of stuff out there in the world to read, and most of it is not literature with a capital L, um, and that's something that I didn't really. It's because of the, the college experience, the high school experience of writing long papers on Hemingway, and I loved Hemingway, and I read I read all of Hemingway, but it was a long time before I got back to this idea that. Most of what people read and most of what I ended up liking to read and most of what I read now is not Hemingway and was not written 100 years ago and will not win a Nobel Prize. Um, and that's not really 
the business that most of publishing is in. That's not what most people write. But for as a as a young person, I'd sort of forgotten that that there's all this this wonderful fiction out in the world that doesn't necessarily have um, the pedigree that what you're what you read in in an academic setting has. Right. I I, uh, have a similar experience when I remember seeing uh, Star Wars in the first grade, I guess it was, when Star Wars came out in uh, 77, 78, whatever it was. And uh, I, you know, we used to have book fairs uh, at school where you would go to the library and, uh, you know, a sales rep for whatever publisher would would have tables set up everywhere. And, And I remember a novelization of Star Wars, and that was the first book that I bought with my own money which i got from my parents but you know with i felt like i was buying it with my own money and uh and and i'm I'm sorry what i bought that book too i remember (laughs) that and i think i bought it at a scholastic book there in my school yes absolutely (laughs) i could still remember the the typeface on the front and it was a white book it was terrific absolutely and and of course i already knew the story i'd seen the movie like everyone else uh but there was something about reading it and and looking for the details behind the scenes so to speak and you know it felt like a different experience and uh i think uh yeah i i i completely um you know, agree with and, and, and your story resonates with me of, you know, that's really that in comic books, uh, got me to read. And as a kid that struggled with dyslexia and things like that, uh, if it weren't for, for these things that eased me into it and, and lowered the barrier to reading for me, uh, you know, I may not be, you know, where I am or the person I am today. So, um, yeah, that, that's, I, I love that part of your story for sure. Uh, so after the, the book writing experience in the third grade and, and you <laughs> realized that this was something that, that you wanted to do, um, you said that this was, uh, this kind of consumed you for, uh, you know, from then on that you were going to work in publishing. Uh, how did you, st- what was your, your path to getting to that point, uh, as you went through school and, and when you got out in the real world? You know, a, <clears throat> excuse me, it was, it wasn't, uh, a straightforward path. And it was just, I was a kid and I, I thought that one day I want to write a book, but I didn't, I didn't actively pursue that in any way until I got to the end of college. And, uh, as an undergraduate, I, I was a political science major. I didn't take creative writing classes. I wasn't, I wasn't all in and I, I had no idea. I was really not pre-professional in any way, certainly not the way almost all college students are now. It, it never really aggressively crossed my mind that I should be studying anything with the hopes of one day getting a job. And I, that sounds so naive now. And it was, there were times when I thought, I'm, all right, I'm going to be an architect or I'm going to be an engineer or I'm going to go to medical school or I'm going to go to law school. These are all things that crossed my mind, but they were not things that I was actively working toward. And um, I feel like I, I, I don't know why I, I was so reluctant to look forward and see what the hell I was going to do when I graduated. And I was not in a, in a ridiculously privileged position to be lounging around and thinking I was going to go to school forever. Um, my parents worked in the school system and I, I, I certainly didn't grow up deprived in any way, but I, I grew up in a rough neighborhood and I borrowed a lot of money to go to college and I worked constantly at second and third jobs, washing dishes and doing this, that and the other. And I was not sort of resting and thinking I'll just, you know, something will one day present itself to me. But I, I, I didn't have a clear idea of how people go about having careers and nobody explained it to me and I didn't go looking for that information. And when I, I left school, I thought, what the hell am I going to do? And I really had no idea. And I knew that I wanted to be, I wanted to do something creative and some type of creative business. And I cast around maybe in advertising, which I'm so glad I did not do. Um, and then I, I tried to get a job in magazines. I, I was really interested in, in long form journalism and, and I, as well as every other recent college graduate who wants to write thought that I should really get a job as a fact checker at the New Yorker. Unbeknownst to me, that job is given out to like one person a year. And I was not that person. Uh, and I, I, I was looking for jobs in publishing, mostly in magazines, and I just didn't get one. And I was a, a substitute teacher for a while, and I tempted a lot. Uh, and then I fell into 
one thing after another, a professional magazine group with accounting journals. I worked there for a few months. I worked at a newspaper that was put together by a bunch of young people and sold by homeless people on the streets of New York City. And these were not permanent gigs for me. And my first permanent job, real job with health insurance and my own phone number, things like that, was at a place called Dell Puzzle Magazines, which published crossword puzzles and, and other puzzles, published 20 magazines a month or something like that. And they were all puzzles and I was an editorial assistant. And one of the reasons I got this job was because I liked doing crossword puzzles. And I found myself as a 22 year old sitting in an office doing crossword puzzles and getting paid for it. And that, that was terrific. And I had a great time at that job. But then after a year and change of that, I thought, oh my God, am I really, this is not what I'm going to do with my life. Uh, this is not a career. This is a job. It's a, and I realized that my Dell Puzzle Magazines was owned by a much bigger company called Bantam Doubleday Dell. They were in in a, a different neighborhood, in a better building, in a better part of town. But they were the, the corporate entity that owned Dell Puzzle Magazines, which was a small outfit. And I made a, an appointment with the Human Resources Department, and I marched over there and said, look, I've been doing this job this amount of time, and I've enjoyed it, but is there anything else I might do at this company? Because I don't think this is permanent. And they rooted around and stuff and came up with that there was a job opening for a copy editor at Doubleday. Uh, and copy editing is something that I'd learned a little bit about in my previous year and change of checking, fact checking and checking spellings and learning punctuation and making sure that uh, certain types of grammar rules are followed. And I took a test and I passed it and I had an interview and it went fine and I, I got a job as a 22 year old, I think, as a junior copy editor working at Doubleday Book Publisher. This was in the early 1990s. And my, my first week on the job, I was given the thing that a lot of copy editors start off doing, which is a, a children's book, because the stakes are low. Uh, there aren't that many words. They're not long. They're not complicated. And you can see what you're up to. Doubleday didn't publish almost any children's books, but there was this one manuscript and it had a few hundred words in it. And I looked over all those words and I noticed that one of them was three syllables, which to me looked like one syllable too long for the intended audience. And I wrote on the page with my little red pencil that I thought this word might be too long and I offered some suggestions. And I took this manuscript and I marched it down the hallway to the editorial assistant who messengered to the author who looked over my notes and messengered it back and gave it back to the editorial assistant who gave it back to the editor who walked down the hall and knocked on my door <laughs> Of my little interior office and said, hi, are you Chris? This was my, my fourth day on the job. And I said, yes. And she said, hi, I'm Jackie Onassis. Oh, and wow. I thank you for pointing out this sort of oversight in the manuscript. And I was sitting there with my jaw hanging on the floor as, and I was sitting there, I was still sitting and she was standing and it was Jackie Onassis thanking me for doing work. And it was terrific. And Doubleday was a terrific place and I didn't know anything about book publishing and I was still this was at a moment in my life when I I was still everything I read was basically literary fiction. I, I chose what I read based on short stories published in the New Yorker based on reviews in the New York Review of Books and then I'd go out and buy these literary novels that sometimes only 160 pages long with lots of white space and all type covers and everything was very, very serious. Uh, and all of a sudden I was working in this place that had my first couple of months on the job. We went one day, there was a, all of a sudden at four o'clock in the afternoon, a celebration in the reception area and everybody was drink, drinking champagne because of the four number one slots on the New York Times bestseller list. Uh, Double Day was about to have three of them. And that was the, the epitome of commercial success, really. But the commercial success in, in books had never really occurred to me as something that people do. You know, that's about selling books to the masses. And that's not what really I thought books were. Uh, books were something that were that were not necessarily for the masses. And here I was in this situation. That I remember it was John Grisham and uh, Bill Moyers who, who were at the top of these lists. And 
And it took me a while to get around to working on any of these sorts of books. It's, it was not a lot of what Double, Double Day had a very broad list. And there was commercial fiction and literary fiction and a lot of nonfiction, some of it serious, some of it uh, very, very how-to, and some of it cookbooks. Um, and I, I ended up working in small parts on all sorts of books. And uh, it was a wonderful experience. And I had my my face in all of these manuscripts, and I was consulting maps and specialized reference books, and I found myself working on the Spanish, tra Spanish translation of the Catholic Catechism. It was such a broad experience with different types of books published for wildly different types of audiences. Uh, and it, it really, I learned so much, and there were so many people at the publishing house, older people who are now, uh, I recognize, I, I thought of them as older then, who are, were then much younger than I am now. And the, there were these old grown-ups in their mid-30s, and they knew what they were doing. And they, they luckily were very nice to me. And I, I learned a lot there about publishing. And I, I slowly learned to embrace uh, the types of books that I'd been ignoring for a while. And it didn't happen in an epiphany all at once, but it, it did happen. I do remember reading um, a a very commercial manuscript and it was going to be a, a number one bestseller. And it was, uh, it's not something that I'd, uh, the type of book that I'd really read before. And I remember it also coincided with the first time that I ever had uh, frozen yogurt. And I remember, <laughs> do you remember the first time you ever had frozen yogurt? You know, I think I do, Chris. I, I think there was a, a, a little yogurt, a frozen yogurt shop that opened in our shopping mall in the little town I grew up in. And, uh, yeah, it was like the first time that there was like soft serve. And it was, yeah. it's a very visceral experience. Yeah. And what I remember so specifically about it was that I, I had always looked at frozen yogurt as something that you had if what you wanted was ice cream. Right. But you didn't want to have all the fatter calories of ice cream. And, and, and until, that didn't occur to me as something that I would pursue until it was way too late. Um, but, but when I was, you know, in my mid-20s, I never wanted any frozen yogurt. If I wanted ice cream, I had ice cream. And then I remember having my first frozen yogurt and thinking, you know what? This is really not bad. It's not ice cream. But if you stop comparing it to ice cream and instead, like, compare it to eating sand, you know, it's really great. And, in fact, it's a – it's – it's a good thing. It's just not the thing that I've been thinking of. It's as, just its own thing. Exactly. It's just its own thing. And it's, it's in a way can be much more enjoyable because you don't have to feel guilty as, or as guilty because you're consuming 900 calories in one minute. Um, and I, and I felt the same way realizing that uh, very broad based commercial fiction is not the same thing as literary fiction. And there's no reason to compare them. It's a different type of culture. It's a different, it's really a different medium. And they both happen to be on the page. And if you don't give it serious thought, you think these are both the same thing, but they're not. And if, if what you're looking for is a book that you're going to turn the page extremely quickly because you need to know what happens at the end of the chapter, that's very different from a book that you want to read extremely slowly because you want to really try to figure out what's going on in every sentence. And those are, in fact, different activities. And those, the books that induce those activities, I think of now as sort of ice cream and frozen yogurt. And they're not, I, I, I stop comparing one to the other and thinking this is commercial crap and it's inferior to the literary art. And I no longer think of either of those as what they are. And I, I've been using those phrases because they're, what I used to think of, but I, I still think of, of literary fiction and genre fiction, um, but I don't think of one as better than the other anymore, and I haven't for a long time now. Um, yeah. I, I have this picture of you, Chris, uh, working, you know, in your, your editorial job and, and starting to, uh, to crack open, you know, a genre fiction book every now and then and, and on the sly and, and it, it kind of infecting you and, uh, and getting this, this joy, uh, of reading back. Was it kind of like that? Yeah. And, you know, I also remember reading an, an article in the New Yorker, um, in which, uh, the the writer read every single book that was on the the New York Times list um, in a given week, and then wrote about the books. And I did I did that myself, and it 
it exposed me to uh, what a romance novel was and just so much stuff that that's out there that that appeals to people who are not necessarily me um but i could see i could see the value in all of it and ever since then i've i've really tried to banish from my mind the idea of good books versus bad books and uh that that's something that as and i, I then went on to work in, in publishing for another 15 plus years and I had all sorts of jobs. I was a, a, a managing editor and an acquiring editor, an executive editor and an associate publisher. And I, I ended up in a position where my job had become a lot more about the finances and process and the business of being, being in publishing and got a, a little bit away from fixing books and trying to figure out which books to publish and trying to figure out which books to publish and reading the proposals and talking to the agents and talking to the authors and reading the manuscripts and staying up late because you've just discovered something you love. That's, that's such a great job to have. And I, I, I really regretted getting myself into a position where it was no longer what I did. And, um, and I was in my late thirties and I quit. I I just realized I was never going to be really good at being a manager, being a publisher, being somebody who woke up every morning thinking about how to make this company more profitable and who to fire, who to hire and how to cut this budget and where to allocate these funds and the whole thing, the the commerce of it, which I I I understand is very important, um but it it got me down that this is the the what the corner office is and that this is what everybody tries to do when they become a grown up is is go off into whatever corner office industry you're in and try to be in charge and i didn't want to be in charge i didn't want to tell people what to do uh i didn't want to be responsible for other people i didn't want to be responsible for bottom lines and um i I felt it was a big failure of my ability to become a full grown up human being that not only didn't I want to, but I couldn't convince myself that even though I didn't want to, I should just do it anyway and stop whining about the fact that you don't want to cut budgets and just cut the goddamn budgets and go about your life. And, you know, uh, that's what people do. But and I, I don't know why I did it. And in large part, um, it was because I felt like I I still, I'd never gotten around to really pursuing writing and, and I was looking for an excuse to say, I, I'm going to fail at being a businessman in large part so I can force myself to see if I can be a success at writing. And that is in fact what I did. I, I think I, I failed in my late thirties to become a successful businessman. And, uh, instead I started writing. The first thing I did though was I, I got a couple of gigs ghostwriting, uh, which was a terrific experience for me. And it, I wasn't ghostwriting for important political figures. I don't want to misrepresent myself. I, I ghost wrote a book about weddings and a book about cocktails. And for the first time in my, my adult life, I didn't have a full-time job where I was at the office every morning and late in every night. And I loved this new lifestyle of mine. And they weren't subjects that I cared passionately about, but I, the writing itself I cared about passionately about and it was very liberating to be instead of writing stuff that I knew about uh, I was writing in somebody else's expertise and trying to write in somebody else's voice and there was a certain a uh, really a high level of freedom there to not worry about being me um, I was trying to be somebody else and that was my job and that felt good and I really loved that job uh, and I, I was doing that for about a year when my wife came home from the office one day, she also works in publishing, and she asked me, what would you think of living in Luxembourg? And at this point, I was 40 years old, really, and we'd been married 10 years, and I, I think of myself as a very honest person, and I prided myself on being very honest with my wife in almost every possible scenario. And at this moment when she asked me that, I could not honestly tell her the truth was I did not know precisely what Luxembourg was. And I was very, 
very ashamed of that. And I knew it was in Europe. I knew it was a place in Europe. But exactly what that meant was not clear to me. I thought maybe it's a city in Germany or a state in Germany or is it possible that it's Belgium? I was almost certain that it was a country, but I was so afraid of being wrong that I, I kept my mouth shut. Um, that was not the end of it. I researched it a little bit, obviously, and found out what Luxembourg was. And uh, she did pursue this job and she got the job. And so we left New York uh, with no specific plan to return and went to Luxembourg. We have twin boys. They were four and a half years old at the time. We got to Luxembourg and she immediately started going to work long hours in a job that required a lot of travel and uh, conference calls at one o'clock in the morning because most of her colleagues were nine time zones away. And I was at home with these little children who I'd never been at home with full time before. I was living in a foreign country trying to get by in a language I didn't really speak. Uh, I also was for the first time somebody who didn't have a paying job in an environment where there were lots of people in my new expat life who didn't have paying jobs, but 99% of them were women and the tiny percentage of them who were men were not people that I was friends with. Um, and it was just such a disorienting experience for me. I, I, nothing about who I'd been a week earlier was who I was anymore. I didn't have a job. I didn't do anything for a living. I didn't have a career in front of me. I didn't know how to speak the language. I didn't know how to take care of children. I didn't know how to cook every day. I didn't know how to run a household. I didn't know how to drive every day, which I was doing for the first time in my life. Um, I didn't know how to do anything. I didn't know how to be this person. And it was not fun at the beginning. I, 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 don't want, I, I don't want to complain too much about the fact that I was living in the middle of Europe and didn't need to work. I mean, that's a great situation to be in. And that, that aspect of it, that adventure and that environment was really exhilarating and beautiful and and strange though and i i never had it as my goal in life to not work i liked working and being in luxembourg and having the children all of a sudden in school all day long and not working really flipped me out and i i didn't know what to do with myself and i i knew that i was gonna write this one of the things I wanted out of this expat experience was that I was going to write about it, but I didn't want to start writing immediately. I very specifically wanted to give it a shot of doing this thing of being home with children and running a household and making sure that we figured out how to get insurance for the dog, which we needed and figured out where we're we going to travel to every other weekend. and How are we going to make friends and how am I going to speak this language and how are my children going to have friends and play dates and, I threw myself in wholeheartedly to that job of being of, of running a household and didn't want to try to pursue something else. Did I didn't want to try writing immediately. I still had some freelance work that was petering out in New York and I didn't want to add any more to it. I wanted to do this thing. I gave myself a year. I'm going to do this for a year. And that year was up and at the end of it I learned how to do everything I needed how to do and I stopped crashing the car all the time. Uh, you know, we did every, all the things on this long checklist of what you need to do when you move to a new country and set up a new life. Uh, I'd accomplished all of those. And we had friends and we had a social life and my kids were happy. And the whole thing was working fine. And we were back in the States for a month for a summer vacation. And then we returned to our second year of being expats in Luxembourg. And the very first day that the kids were in school that second year, I took a laptop computer to a cafe and I opened up a new word processing document and I typed the X at the type of the top of the page and I started writing that book. Uh, yeah. And what a phenomenal book it is. Um, did after working the um, the freelance work that you were doing uh, where you were uh, ghost writing and a lot of these how to books or, or things like that, uh, mm -hmm. since you were kind of familiar you know, got to be familiar with that style of writing and that style of, of book uh, was the and and you knew that you wanted to write this this book about expats and and you know that the story obviously started unfolding to you. But did you ever uh, was the temptation ever there to write this as a memoir? Uh, you know, of as a a look at your time there as opposed to a novel. Uh, you know, based around these experiences. 
Um, well, the temptation there was to write a bunch of different books. So I, I started writing the expats. I had no idea what book I was going to write. And I, I thought about it over the summer. What am I going to write when I start writing? And I really didn't know and I couldn't figure it out. And I told myself, all right, don't worry about that. Just try to start writing and then figure it out. And I did. I started writing the expats. It was really a very, very, very personal book. And it was it had as a, as its protagonist somebody who was a lot like me, except for a lot of reasons, I turned it into the protagonist into a woman. But in, in almost every other respect, the protagonist was me, the life was my life, the plot was the plot of my life, which in which nothing was really happening. Um, and I thought, all right, I'm going to figure out somewhere along the way what's going to happen. I'm going to invent this. I'm going to invent that. But I didn't know what type of book I was writing until three months later. I'd, I'd written 100 pages and change when I realized that the type of book I was writing was a very, very bad book. And <laughs> that was because I'd spent so long publishing, I knew that you don't want to write a bad book in which nothing happens. And uh, my experiment had not worked. I had not figured out what the book was going to be just by starting to write it. Uh, I figured out in a lot of ways what I didn't want it to be. And so the, the book that I'd initially started writing was something that I'd probably call now literary fiction. And it was about the themes of, of disorientation uh, that comes with being an ex very much heightening the disorientation that comes with being a new parent and being jobless for the first time. And that was really all it was about. And that's a type of book in which if it's done extremely well with a writer who's extraordinarily good at crafting sentences and scenes and painting character is the type of book that I can see myself really enjoying to read. But I didn't think as I was writing it that I was doing a good job of it. I thought I was doing a very bad job of it. And I realized that I had no idea how to write a novel, that I'd spent 20 years working in publishing working around writing, and I think that I knew how to fix a bad sentence, but I didn't really know how to write a good one. And I didn't know how to write a good character, I didn't know how to write a good story, and I didn't know what the hell that story was gonna be. So I put that project aside, and I thought, Jesus, you're really bad at this. And now I didn't, I didn't think to myself, I didn't beat myself up over that. I, I realized I'm bad at this because I've never done it before. I should be bad at this. If I thought that I was going to be good at this just from the get-go, I'm an idiot. That's not how life works. You don't just walk up to Major League home plate and take a 95-mile-an-hour fastball and hit a home run. That's, that's as ridiculous, I think, as thinking that you're going to sit down for the first time in your life and write a great novel. And I wasn't writing a great novel. And I, I, I realized that one of the things that – i would learned about publishing, working in it for so long, is that uh, it's really important to know what type of book it is, what what audience you're looking for, who it can be compared to. It's sort of in it, at this moment in time, I think there's something like 250 million adult reading Americans, and in any given year, the best-selling adult new book, new novel, will sell maybe two and a half million copies, which is to say that in the best case scenario, 99% of American readers won't read your book. That's the best case scenario. The the ideal audience, the best audience you can hope for is 1% of the readers. And you need to figure out who those readers, I think, you need to figure out who those readers are going to be. What types of, what are they looking for? And I realized that I was I, the book that I was writing to begin with, I didn't have a particular audience in mind. I didn't know what sort of book it was supposed to be. I had no idea how to describe it. And so instead of trying to figure out what I wanted to, what I thought I could contribute to the world, I was simply trying to figure out what it is that I wanted to say. And I, I, I'd had this conversation with a lot of authors over the years. That the, There are a lot of people who go into writing because they really have something they want to get off their chests. And I think a lot of people don't say it, but they feel it. I also want to prove how smart I am. And I think that for some people who are very smart and have something really important to get off their chest, that might work. But for a lot of people, I think that doesn't work, that that's not what books are for. That's what journals are for. That's what diaries are for. If you have something you really need to get off your chest, 
I think the diary is the right place for you. Books, publication, getting a book out there into the world is for the world, I think. It's for the readers. It's not for the author. It's for the readers. And I wanted to figure out, as I was sitting there in Luxembourg, what type of thing can I deliver to what type of reader? What am I in a position to do? What have I learned in my life? What voice do I have that somebody would want, not just that I want to say, but that someone would want to hear, that someone would want to read? What story can I tell? What position am I in that sheds any light on anything? And I, I realized that the, the being an expat situation was something that, was, that could be interesting, but not interesting enough. And I realized also that I liked spy novels and I liked thrillers and that there was a certain plot point that I could come up with about spouses lying to each other or one spouse lying to the other uh, that could make this, this pointless story I was writing into something with a point. And the more I, I was thinking about that, the more it, it dawned on me, a long, slow dawn really, um, that the book that I should write is a spy thriller. And I was thinking about that for a few months, and then I just started to read a bunch of what I thought of as the best ones, some of them for a second time, trying to figure out also, all right, if you're going to write a spy thriller, um, are you going to want to write spy thrillers for the next 30 or 40 years? Like, is this the thing you're going to do with the second half of your career? Because among other things, I think that what I learned in book publishing, you don't really get to decide to change mind about that, that almost nobody has a successful career writing a different type of book every couple of years, that uh, that's not really the way the world works in any endeavor. You don't decide as a, a cardiologist one day that um, you're all going to some become a gastroenterologist. Like you, you pick a lane and you're in it. And some, some of those lanes are pretty narrow and some of them are broader, but there's really very few fields of endeavor where you get to hop around from one specialty to another. And I don't think books are one of them. I, I don't think, with very rare exceptions, there are any, any novelists who can write a different sort of book uh, every time they do it, or even twice or three times. And I think almost everybody, and I'm not saying people write the same book over and over again, but I, for example, Dave Eggers writes very different books that I, I like a lot, but they're all, in, a, in one way, extremely similar. They all have a similar voice. They're all for a similar type of audience. It'll all be characterized as literary fiction. One of them is not going to be a crime novel, while the next one is a romance, while the next one is literary fiction, while the next one is historical fiction. Like That's, that's not really how it works for anybody. And I think people who try that uh, almost exclusively fail. And um, I think there's one or two writers a generation who can make it work. And I, I just read one of those books, in fact, by someone I admire immensely, um, Jennifer Egan, who... Uh, I've read everything she's written, and her most recent book, Manhattan Beach, is a historical crime novel, and it's spectacular, but it has almost nothing to do with the previous books that she's written, except it's a sort of similar voice, but besides her, I can't think of anybody else who does it, and I knew that I was not going to try to do that. What I was going to try to do was figure out the type of book that I could see myself writing um, and be good at that, and learn a lot about it, and and, and that's what I decided to do about international thrillers or thrillers uh, with a lot of plot twists. And I thought, yeah, that's something that I can do. That's something that I like to read. That's something that I can see myself doing variations of. And it's something that I think is broad enough to uh, offer the rewards of being able to write a different book every few years without it being a different type of book, if that makes sense. Yeah. At this point, did your uh, uh, your college career uh, kick in and, and become meaningful to you, the, the studies that you did with uh, in political science? You know what? It didn't. Uh, I, <laughs> I decided, among other things, that I, the, the, the international thrillers that I wanted to write were not going to be about international politics. I wanted to um, I wanted to write a type of genre fiction that is very, very character focused. And uh, I, what I'd learned reading j the genre fiction I'd read over the years is the, the, the most important thing to me as a reader in all of those books was always the characters. And I, I really liked Jean Le Carre because those books, even though they had a, a backdrop of international espionage, were really about 
characters and career and betrayal and then intimate relationships and the spying aspect, the international politics aspect that was really just there to telegraph to readers, the types of relationships that we'd be talking about in the book. And that's the sort of thing that I wanted to do. I didn't want to write books where there was a tremendous amount of, of spy craft in them or descriptions of guns or, or history of, of post-war Germany that I, not that I don't I respect books that have those, but they're not the things that I like most about reading these types of books. I, I wanted to write for an audience. That's not me, but people like me, people who like to read these sorts of books that are, that are character based thrillers, character based mysteries. And, uh, to that end, I don't really want to fill my books with lots of research. I, the research that I do, uh, is going places and getting a feel for Lisbon or Barcelona or the Northern coast of Iceland and using those locations as ways to communicate things to readers about the scenes and about the relationships that are going on. And, and I'm not trying to write travel books, but that, that research that I do uh, is not historical and is not political. And uh, I still read books that do, do have a lot of history and politics in them. I just want to write them. Uh, so my, polit my college classes didn't inform so much of what I write, much more so the the reading I did as a young adult, what I still think of as very character of trying to move a lot of that approach to building a scene into uh, a thriller superstructure. Right. Um, the you said that you had started this book uh, and then later figured out what the book was going to be. Uh, did you completely scrap everything that you had worked on previous to that, or did you just find a way, uh, like, okay, this is what the book is now. Let me retrofit the things I've already built and uh, and bring the story together. I completely scrapped it. I scrapped everything about it, um, and I started afresh, and I started by writing a one-page description of the book, uh, and I worked on that very diligently for a while. What is, what's the pitch here? What's this story about? Uh, why should anybody care? And once I thought I had that, then I, I started plotting out, I had about a dozen, uh, at the, in the end, reveals, plot twists that I wanted to introduce, and I, I made a list of those and the sequence in which I wanted those to be revealed. Uh, and then I wrote an outline that filled in uh, those dozen plot twists with descriptions of what would be in the chapter, what the action would be, who, who would be in the chapter, what, the, what questions I wanted readers to, to take away from every, every passage, every chapter, uh, which... Um, to me is very important in in the type of fiction I write uh, the type a lot of the type of fiction I read is I think I, I enjoy books the most when new questions are constantly being asked and th those new questions are not necessarily big cliffhangers like what's going to happen next they're they're just a constant stream of making you as a reader think what the hell what the hell has gone on in the past, what's going to go on in the future, um, why, is, why does that character have a scar? Like I, I think every, every passage needs to be generating questions. And some, I, I hope that readers don't even know that they're asking themselves those questions, but I know that I'm leading them to this thing and really all the time, hundreds, thousands of questions, what, why, who, when, where, what, what the hell is this? And I think it's a, a, a sort of subtle thing to be constantly dropping hints in of why is this character limping or who is that character referencing? And, and I, I, I think it's difficult to figure out as, as a creator of that type of thing when I'm doing too much of that and I'm just pissing people off and making them confused and when it's the right amount of intrigue. Um, and that's one of the reasons that I try not to have all these questions be super explicit because I don't want people to be frustrated with that. So I try to ask a lot of implicit questions. And as I was, I was figuring out how to write this book, I, that's one of the things I was figuring out. 
in the outline. What question, what's the main question I want readers to feel at the end of each chapter? What is it that they're looking to learn next? How am I going to withhold that answer while at the same time providing enough information to be satisfying and perhaps asking a new question? And that, that process of figuring out what the plot points are going to be, what are the reveals, what's going to happen in the chapters. Once I had that, that superstructure, then I started going back and, and writing the book. And I, I wrote a bunch of character sketches first, the background information. And then I started writing the whole thing. And as I went through, which took me a while, and in the meantime, we moved back to New York from Luxembourg. Um, and I decided to continue to try to work on this book and to not go back to doing something similar to what I've been doing before. I changed around this outline so much. I changed the sequence of the reveals. I invented new characters. Uh, I, I had all sorts of different things going on. And then I gave it to readers, and they had comments for me, and I changed those things around. And then I thought I was done. And I, I still hadn't uh, given it to an agent yet, but I, I had had a half dozen readers or so. And one of them is a guy who I'd known for a while, who's a... I'd been a publisher for 40 or 50 years and a, a, a pretty well-known editor. He'd edited a lot of great books and I gave him the manuscript and he read it and we had lunch. And as publishing lunches go, the very normal thing is you, you go through a meal and you talk about books you like to read and books that you've read recently that were great and books that you hated and who just got fired and which bestseller is horrible and, you know, all the gossipy things. And then you don't talk about the substance of your meeting until somebody gets the bill and pays the check and you've only got five minutes left at the table. So when those five minutes were, were there in front of us, he leaned forward and said, Chris, I like the book very much, but not enough happens. And then he basically shook my hand and left. And I was sort of sitting there going, holy crap, not enough happens. Um, what do I do about that? And it was such a broad editorial note so, and so different from what other people had given me previously, which is sitting down and going through the manuscript for two hours and people were pointing out ways in which this character didn't make sense and this the distance between the reader's point of view and the, the, the uh, protagonist's point of view was too inconsistent and all sorts of things. And that was all helpful. But what was so much more helpful in the end was that really broad thing. Not enough happens. And I was left with what to do about that. And I had had this epiphany then of just trying to make more happen as a thing that I wanted to do. Not just because he told me to, but because uh, I could figure that out. Like, here's a puzzle. What else can happen? And one of the things I decided to do there was to take what I thought was the last big twist of the novel and say, I told myself, all right, that's no longer the last big twist. Make another one. And that to me is now what I've done. I just finished writing my fourth book with, with all of them, that that's the thing that I want to do, that that note of make more happen and my approach to figuring out how to make more happen was to do that thing, is whatever I initially thought was going to be the biggest complexity of the book, make that the second biggest complexity and try to figure out how it can be more complex, how a reader can be more surprised. And then there's a big thing, a big task ahead of me, once I figure that out, to go back through the rest of the book and make it make sense and make that last big reveal not something that makes a reader's jaw drop and say, oh, that's bullshit, but make a reader's jaw drop and say, ah, of course. And that's, that's now my goal. And I don't know if I've ever gotten to that goal, but I know that that's what I'm trying to do. And I would never have done that had it not been for that ridiculously broad note I got in my first manuscript. One thing that is very um, uh, that, that kind of hits you in the face when you first open the expats is that it's in present tense uh, and it's very immersive. Um, I mean, from page one, you literally are dropped into the middle of the story. Uh, was that a uh, part of your conscious effort to make more happen? Uh, was that uh, a, a tool that you used to drop the reader right in and, and get them invested right off the bat? Yeah. I love present tense. I, I, there are, 
there are a lot of rules bandied about in writing and creative writing programs and publishing. A lot of people are talking about write what you know or conversely write what you don't know or present tense is horrible or uh, you know, first person is blah, 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 blah. I, I don't believe um, I don't believe in any rules. I think any sort of book, if it's well executed, can be good for the type of reader who likes that book. And some audiences are, are larger than others. Um, I think for for a thriller, for something that's supposed to be edge of the sea, I I think present tense can work really well. I'm not saying it works uh, better for everybody, for every writer or for every reader, but for me as a writer, I feel like I want to be in present tense. And also I feel like I the present tense is also a way of trying to make it visual, uh, which I – for me is is a very big priority in what I'm trying to accomplish. I I hope that readers see, feel, smell, even sometimes taste some scenes. That I want you as a reader to be viscerally moving through these scenes as if you're living there. And I that I don't even I don't write uh, first person. I'm I'm doing this in third person. I don't want you to imagine that you're the protagonist. I want you to imagine that you're in this scene somehow as would be in a movie that uh, this is how it, this is how the character feels. This is how the light looks. This is how the snow is falling. This is how uh, the, the door sounds when it slams. I, these are all things that I want you to be feeling. And I, I, I try very hard to make sure in some way, and I, I don't like writing paragraph long descriptions of streets. I don't think readers want to read them. I try to do it economically, and I try also for physical descriptions, especially of of scenes, of places, to have a, a role, a symbolic role, other than simply describing a place. I, I don't like describing places merely to put you in a scene, but I, I want the clouds to mean something, or the sun to mo- mean something, or the fact that this cliff is that a place that looks like the end of the world with the waves crashing. I want that to mean something and not just feel something. I want it to mean something for the story. Um, and present tense is, uh, uh, can be a big part of that. Yeah. Uh, in writing thrillers and, uh, and, and you talked about your writing process and how you, uh, you outline, uh, in, in great detail or, you know, at least you have a, uh, you have a great understanding of the story, uh, before the actual writing happens. Uh, does writing in present tense, uh, cause you to, uh, pay particular attention to the timeline of how things are happening uh, because the reader is uh, viewing it as it happens. Uh, d- does that change your, your, your planning of your reveals and things like that? Yeah. And uh, timeline is, I, some, I, I'm not uh, averse to jumping around a little bit and going back into back tense and then into present tense. And sometimes I, I like as a reader being a little bit confused about when something is happening and who it's happening to. And I try to inject a little bit of that into, into what I'm writing. And one of the, one of my biggest challenges is in that timeline. And, uh, the half of the books that I've written take place in one day. Um, and that's that to me that, and I, that's fresh in my mind because it's a manuscript I just finished working on takes place over the course of one, of one day. And that that's really uh, hard to deal with. Um, and I, I, it's, it's something that I impose on myself, not abstractly. It's not, I'm not trying to be clever here and that this all takes place in one day. Um, that the, the point of it is, is not abstract so much as this concrete desire for the story to be something that is almost digestible in real time. If you know what I mean, that if, if wake up in the morning as my character does in this book and read all day, you go to sleep at night having finished this book. And I I don't think anybody's going to do that, but that's sort of the feeling that I'm trying to create. And and hopefully that, that urgency of it takes an hour to read this hour sort of thing um, will help propel readers through because it's sort of, it's, it's in real time. But I, in books where there, as this recent one is where there are, there are uh, a half dozen major characters and it's all taking place basically in one city and they're interacting with each other. Knowing exactly what time it is, is, is hard to keep track of and hard to get right and hard for um, a continuity point of view. 
Uh, and, but it's also fun. I mean, I, I really, I love figuring out when and where and who these things are happening to them. I, I really love making these books and I like the writing part as much as I like the figuring out part. I like both of them equally. Um, the, the typing part of, of spending four hours straight writing a scene. I love that part, but, uh, I also just figuring out who's doing what, and what, what's happening. I really love it. Being in control of an entire universe that you've created and, and characters that you get to put in harm's way, uh, and then help them figure out how to get out of harm's way. Uh, it's, it's really one of the best feelings in the entire world. Um, I, I can commiserate with you there. Right. Uh, you, you went on to, uh, to, to write a, a second book, The Accident, and your newest book is called The Travelers. I know that you said that you've uh, finished a fourth book, uh, mm -hmm. that hopefully will be out soon. Um, but it, we, uh, we have spent an entire hour, uh, talking up to this point. Um, uh, yeah, uh, what have you, uh, in, in publishing your third book, The Travelers, which is out now, and it's a fantastic book. I highly recommend everybody go grab a copy of it. Um, but can you just give us a, a little insight into what maybe you learned uh, between book one and, and book three publishing and now writing book four. Um, how have, have you matured as a writer and how has your process changed? That's a great question. And you know what, how I've matured as a writer is I think I, I'm much more clear about the sort of book that I'm trying to write that uh, I, I don't screw around with, with, text that I'm going to realize later is completely beside the point of what I'm trying to write. And I, uh, that I think is so crucial to, to any type of writing, but in particular to writing fiction in, in nonfiction, it's much easier for someone, uh, an editor or reader to point out to you how little this matters. Um, but in fiction, I think it's a lot harder for people to see when you've clouded up, so much that doesn't matter with the stuff that does. And I think I figuring out what in your book doesn't need to be there and shouldn't be there, which is also part of the challenge of figuring out what book you should not write, um, what, what projects you should set aside and either never pursue or pursue later in a different way. I think that's, that's so hard. And I think that's the biggest challenge really of being a writer. Once, once you have any audience or any success or even any publisher, you've gotten a book published and it has not failed miserably. People or publishers are willing to publish you some more. Um, at that point for book number two, it's a lot easier to get published for book number three, for book number 10, it's a lot easier to get published. I think it can be a lot harder to figure out whether the book that you're writing is the right book for you to be writing. And I, I'm very curious about how other novelists figure that out. And that I, the idea, the horrible question that you ask any, any author, especially a novelist, I think is where do your ideas come from? Who the hell knows where your ideas come from? I, I think more importantly is how do you choose which exactly you're going to execute and which ones you're going to set aside um, and that's I, a that's a recurring theme on this show is that um, ideas are everywhere. They're all around us. I, you know, if you just sometimes if you just shut up and open your eyes and ears, uh, ideas are inundating you from every uh, every direction. But it's the one that rises above and and and, you know, becomes a new story of its own in your brain. Uh, th there's something special and magical about that. Yeah. And it happens in any creative endeavor. And I think it's probably equally impossible for anybody to answer. Um, I, but I think with, with novelists, unlike maybe painters or songwriters, you don't have that many opportunities. You don't have that many chances to be wrong. If you're wrong at the wrong time with the wrong novel, one wrong book, that could really be the end of your career in a lot of ways. And, you know, you, you, put out a rock and roll album with a dozen songs and nobody cares about 11 of them, but the 12th is a hit. You're in good shape. Uh, that doesn't happen with novels. You don't get to produce hundreds of them unless you're some type of lunatic. You can get to produce at most one a year for most people. I don't do that. Donna Tartt writes one book every decade and luckily she's been right about all of them. But if Donna Tartt writes a book that's horrible, 
my God, 19 years are going to go by and there's been nothing but a horrible book of hers out there in the world. Um, and I, so the, I feel like one of the things that I'm doing a better job of right now is figuring out, uh, not just pursuing a book because an idea came to me and I sat down and wrote it because I, I needed to do something. Um, but because I'm figuring out what's the next book I should write and why and what are the benefits of it for me and for readers and for my publisher. Um, and I, I think a lot of people talk about how they're just, they, they're driven to something and they, they, they can't ignore it. And I, I think that's, that's admirable, that's laudable, and that's perhaps even true for a lot of people. Uh, but I don't think that's the entire truth of figuring out what what book to write. And I think if that's the only truth you have, then you're very lucky if that works out for you. I think it is important to figure out, why should I write this book now? Why now? Why this book? And that's something that's taken me a while to figure out. And uh, and I, I think I'm doing better at it with each book. I hope I am. Absolutely. Um, Chris Pavone, uh, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show. If people uh, are uh, intrigued by what you say and, uh, and, and if their interest has been piqued uh, about these books that you've written, where can they find you online to uh, connect with you and to, to get plugged into your work? I'm at chrispavone.com and I – I love hearing from anybody about anything, um, uh, with the exception of typos from a book published six years ago, which are not that interesting to deal with at this point. Um, but I, I, I love hearing from anybody, and I, I like engaging with people over what's in my books and, uh, and the rest of the world. Excellent. Chris, uh, I'm a big fan, and uh, I've enjoyed our chat today. Thank you for taking time to come on the show. It's been great. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Jason yanked the coils of safety rope to one shoulder and heaved them out the attic window. The bundle bounced over the roof line and dropped to the yard below. He tightened the harness, making sure the shoulder straps were snug over his sweatshirt. He threaded his rope through the braking device, tested it, and clipped everything to the carabiner at his navel. So far, so good. Fireman Mike would be proud. His stomach flipped as he neared the octagonal window. Had he tied the correct knots? Would he get himself killed? Weeks had passed since Mike's tutorial and... But he had to attempt the break-in now, while both Van Brunts were at the Christmas Eve service. He swung his legs through the window and felt for the roof. His sneakers gripped the shingles and he wriggled out, grateful for once to have feet as big as snowshoes. He pulled on a ski mask and sang, Spider-Man, Spider-Man, does whatever a spider can. He lowered his body. Wind punched him in the jaw like a supervillain, surprising him. His sweatshirt rode up and snow burrowed into his navel. He looked down but couldn't see his feet. He relaxed his hands and put a few ounces of weight on the rope. Clots of snow broke away, dove over the edge, and took far too long to hit ground. He drew his rope around the pipe and pulled tight. Now he could drop. No, you will not drop. You will repel. You will repel very safely. He backed towards the edge, towards the point of no return. The backyard lurched into view. It was a four-story fall, and he'd probably hit the stairs on the way down. He sledded helplessly. His legs fell, swung, and kicked the side of the house. Alarm bells went off in his head. He gripped the rope. It looked like nothing. A shoelace. Jason Crane, you're a damn fool. He went limp and fell over. The rope gave a jolt and the harness tried to castrate him. He twisted, trying to save his poor descendants. He began to spin. His arm bashed through a row of icicles. The spin slowed, reversed, and at last he came to a stop with his back to the house, dangling over the backyard. Thank you, rope. That's a good rope. Well done. He tried to turn around, but couldn't. 
With patience, he worked out a method of kicking in circles and managed to press his sneakers to the side of the house. He needed slack. He gathered his loose rope to the small of his back and disengaged the brake. Zip! He fell fast, all his weight on the rope now. His feet, planted, shot up over his head. The brake caught him, and the rope vibrated as wildly as a guitar string striking a note of panic. Jason heard a crunching sound and looked up. The leaf gutter crumpled and poured a stream of bitter ice water into his eyes. He snarled and wiped his face, dripping humiliation. Jason rested a moment and stared at his reflection in the glass. He was an enormous Macy's balloon drifting over New Jersey, tethered at the navel like underdog. How the hell did you get up here, kid? He did an awkward split, one foot above the window and the other below, hanging sideways with his weight on one hip. He closed his eyes and reached for the sill, crouching against the side of the house. His fingernails found the weather stripping, and he tugged. Locked. He cursed and tugged again, anger rising. He grabbed the frame with both hands and pulled with all his spider strength. Something popped. The window rose and the curtains splashed out. Jason dove headfirst into the fabric, wriggled and kicked, let out some rope and fell with a whump into his archenemy's lair.